Good morning. Good morning, everyone. Can I just invite you to come in to the main church and take a seat? Um, it's great to have you all with us for our morning service here at Crescent Church. Um, if you're a visitor with us today, can I make you especially welcome? It's our prayer as a church that your time spent with us this morning will be a blessed one. In particular, I'd like to welcome any of the university students here um, who are here with Church Search, the CU's Church Search this morning. Um, we're hope you're, we hope you're settling into life in Belfast well, and you'll enjoy your time with us this morning. Um, also, if you're able to hang around after the service, we'll be having a student lunch here in the church, um, so it'd be great if you're able to stay for some fellowship with us this morning. Um, this morning, we're continuing our series in the book of Exodus, and our speaker this morning is Jim Crooks, and he'll be looking at the topic of the prince of this world. Um, we're going to open our service by singing the words of You Are the Great I Am, which is number 497 in the hymn book. The first verse of this hymn says, You are the great I am, forever you shall be. Let every angel sing of your perfect authority. Every knee will bow and every tongue confess, you are the great I am, the first and the last. So let's stand to sing this hymn of praise after the introduction. <laughs> Let's just commit our service before the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for this, your day, and for the chance for us to be together, to come together to worship you and hear from your word. Lord, we just pray as Jim opens your word this morning that we'll be receptive to the message that he has to bring to us from the book of Exodus, and that it'll work in our hearts and we'll have that thought in our minds as we leave and start into this new week. But we also just wanna pray for all the different um, activities and ministries that have started up again um, at the start of this new term. We pray for our own here at the church. We pray for rallies and Sunday school and, and Rooted. We pray that as 
young people, young, young adults are impacted by the Bible that we as teachers will be able to share with them and to bring them closer to you. But we also just want to remember the university as well. We pray for the Queen CU and for iCafe in particular that these ministries will um, reach out to students on campus and bring many of those to know you more. I just want to commit the rest of this service into your hands now. In your son's holy name, amen. I have a few um, announcements to bring for you, uh, bring you this morning, so just bear with me. Um, this evening at 7 p.m., Brooke Mullen will be concluding our series, Like a Tree, from Psalm 1. Um, and Brooke's topic will be maturity. So it would be great if you could join with us again this evening. Um, this week sees the return of home groups for this incoming term. Um, on Tuesday, there is a group who meet here in the church at 10.30 a.m., and then on Thursday at 8 p.m., there are various groups who meet across the greater Belfast and Lisburn areas. And if you want to know more about home groups, or maybe you're already someone part of a home group but don't have one of the study books for 1 Corinthians, please speak to Gareth Lewis, who's on the piano this morning. Our, our Marriage Matters course will be commencing on Wednesday, the 11th of October, and it's an eight-week course on Wednesday evenings at 8 p.m., um, this for married couples using the material of Paul Tripp. The nights will be led by Glenn and Heidi Johnson from Scrabble Hall, and there's a chance for couples to discuss between themselves the material that has been shared that evening. There's a few spaces available, so you can sign up from, or for this using the Google form that's being distributed. Next Sunday morning, we will be continuing our series in the book of Exodus, and our speaker next Sunday morning is Tony Cullen, and Tony will be looking at the topic of arguing with God. And then next Sunday evening, Tim Graham will be commencing a new series looking at the Gospel of Matthew. And Tim's topic will be the coming of Jesus. It would be great if you could join with us next Sunday. Believe it or not, it's 87 Sleeps to Christmas. And one of the main Christmas programs that we as a church are part of is the Samaritan's Purse Shoebox Appeal. It would be great if we could start thinking about gathering items for a shoebox to send to a child across the world. Um, there are leaflets about the, the shoebox appeal in the foyer, and that will contain all the information that you'll need. And also, there will be a packing party here in the church on Saturday the 11th of November to put together shoeboxes that can be sent out. Um, more details on that are to follow. So it would be great if we could start thinking about the shoebox appeal and what we could do to support that. One extra announcement um, I want to give is that this Wednesday, the 4th of October, at 7.30 p.m., there is an evening with Ed Drew, who is, from, who is the um, Ministry Director of Faith in Kids. And Ed is giving um, a talk and a, a session on work with children and um, just youth work in general. So for any um, young adults ministry or youth ministry um, volunteers here in the church, it'd be great if you could join with us for that evening at 7.30 here in the church. Finally, um, as always, tea and coffee will be served down in the cafe through the doors on my right behind me. Um, it would be great if you could stay behind after the service for some time of fellowship. We're now going to have a short time of praise, singing two hymns, and we'll start by singing hymn number 41, I Have a Shepherd, and we'll follow that on with the Sovereign Grace version of Turn Your Eyes. Um, sorry, number 41, Be Thou My Vision. Not, not I have a shepherd, be thou my vision. And the last verse of be thou my vision says, High King of heaven, after victories won, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's son. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. So can we stand and sing, first be thou my vision, and then turn your eyes.
Thank you to the band for leading us in our hymns of praise this morning. Um, as mentioned earlier, our speaker this morning is Jim Crooks. Um, Jim is one of our regular Bible teachers here at the Crescent and is also the co-host of the Equip Project podcast, which I would recommend. Um, Jim also was speaking at CU on Monday night, so some of our students may recognize Jim as well. Um, Jim is continuing our series from the book of Exodus, and his topic this morning is the Prince of the World. Um, Jim, the rest of the time is over to you now. Well, good morning, everyone. It's very good to be with you. Uh, can I make you all uh, most welcome to the church this morning? Uh, as Alex says, we're in the middle of a major series on the book of Exodus, and this morning we're going to consider chapters 5 and 6. And to help us see the full arc of the story, we might have to creep back into the end of chapter 4 and on into the early verses of chapter 7. Uh, before we begin, let's just have a quick word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, as you look down upon us now and see this collection of precious individuals, each with our longings and disappointments, our hopes and aspirations and fears, we ask humbly, Lord, that you would speak to us through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. I wonder if we put up uh, my magnificent slide. Um, I think they're too embarrassed to put it up, to be perfectly honest. Um, my, my PowerPoint skills are as fashionable as ever. Um, on, September, on Sunday the 3rd of September 1939, the British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain gave a five-minute broadcast uh, in which he declared war against Nazi Germany. As you all know, the Second World War started disastrously for the Allies. So by the end of May 1940, over 300,000 British troops had to be evacuated from Dunkirk and returned safely to Britain in an almost miraculous uh, exercise. And over that summer, the future of our country hung in the balance uh, while the RAF and the Luftwaffe waged war in the skies over southern England. Eventually, however, Hitler's armies were beaten back. The long war waged all across the world only came to an end in 1945, and no one listening to Neville Chamberlain's broadcast way back in 39 would have believed that the war would last so long. Ah, I see my slide has arrived. It has the visual appeal of a memo from the Soviet Interior Ministry. Uh, but it lays out the key landscape for our study. Now, please do not use it to try and work out an estimated time when I will stop, because some points will last longer than others. So the storyline of the, the Great Second World War is quite similar to the arc of the story we read in Exodus chapters 5 through 10. It begins with an initial defeat, and we'll read about that in chapter 5, and then comes the realistic expectation of a long war. Now, that complicated, difficult story uh, comes as a complete surprise, given how chapter 4 ends. So let's just read the last three verses of Exodus chapter 4 together. Verse 29. Moses and Aaron brought together all the elders of the Israelites, and Aaron told them everything the Lord had said to Moses. He also performed the signs before the people, and they believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about them and had seen their misery, they bowed down and worshipped. Moses has just been commissioned by God at the burning bush, and he's delighted to have his older brother Aaron at his side. And in the verses we've just read, the two brothers tell the Israelite about God's great promises uh, to redeem his people, to rescue them from their terrible life in slavery. And the words of the old African-American spiritual are based on these verses. Go down, Moses, way down in Egypt's land. Tell old Pharaoh, let my people go. All Moses' fears about the Israelites chasing him away evaporate as he sees the people respond in faith and worship. The whole scheme seems to be going brilliantly. But someone stood in the way of that plan. The Pharaoh of Egypt, he may have been an uncle uh, within Moses' Egyptian foster family, and Pharaoh was a defiant, rebellious man. Like all Egyptian rulers, he considered himself to be a demigod, a direct descendant of the creator god. So let's now read about him in verses 1 to 5 of Exodus chapter 5. Afterwards, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. 
Let my people go so that they may hold a festival to me in the wilderness. Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey him and let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Now, let us take a three-day journey into the wilderness to offer sacrifices to the Lord our God, or he may strike us with plagues or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you taking the people away from their labor? Get back to your work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. Pharaoh is regarded with horror throughout the rest of the Bible. Romans 9 describes him as a vessel of wrath. And at first sight, that verdict seems a little harsh. I mean, think of all the wildly immoral, deceitful, greedy people we meet in the Old Testament. And none of those sins are recorded against Pharaoh. Pharaoh's great sin was that he defied God. Six feet of clay stood up in front of God Almighty and shook his fist in defiance. As a materialist, Pharaoh simply refused to acknowledge that the earth was the Lord's. I used the phrase long war a minute ago. And as we shall see over the next two studies, the long war between God and Pharaoh took the form of nine plagues and one final judgment. And the war was over one single issue. Who owns this universe? Are mere men free to do what they want with it because they've planted their flag on the earth? Or does God own the universe and everything in it? There are moments in the long war when Pharaoh realizes that he had sinned. But even with that realization, he cannot bring himself to repent, to bow down and acknowledge God as God. And so Moses and Aaron walk along the marble, marble paved courtyards of the palace into Pharaoh's presence. God had wanted the elders of the Israelites to accompany them, but it seems as if they got cold feet. And so the two brothers make an entirely reasonable request. Following God's instructions, they ask for a three-day holiday for the slaves to go out into the desert for a festival where they could worship God. God was setting a test for Pharaoh, one that he failed spectacularly. Who is the Lord, sneers Pharaoh. Now I want you to notice the two negatives in verse 2. I do not know the Lord, and I will not let Israel go. I do not know, I will not. Other pharaohs had allowed slaves time off to worship their gods. But this stubborn man's heart is so lifted up with pride that he defies the living God. And perhaps you can begin to see why Pharaoh occupies such an important place in Scripture. He is a visual aid, a prototype of another sinister figure who defies God. John, in his gospel, calls that figure the prince of this world. We know him as Satan. And in the end, Satan will use a literal man. Scripture calls him the lawless one or the man of sin or the antichrist to defy God in humanity's final and terrible rebellion. So it will be important for us to examine Pharaoh's tactics here. And he does two things. First, he crushes worship. And second, he destroys faith. And when you think of those tactics, this ancient story comes rushing into our own culture. The spirit of the Antichrist is at work today, employing those same two tactics, crushing worship and destroying faith. Take a young student in her first term of university, to be entirely hypothetical. She finds her degree subject interesting. <laughs> that was, I am definitely being hypothetical. She enjoys all the good things that campus life can offer, but she knows that there is more to life than working and sleeping and eating, more to life than psychology and biology. So on Sundays and Monday evenings, she lifts her voice in song, praising the God who saved her from her sins. Her heart fills with gratitude when she hears the Savior's voice read from the scriptures. She knows the hope of eternal life. But soon our student will discover the dark side of campus life. It is driven by ideologies that are determined to crush her ability and her desire to worship God. 
Give up all those childish fairy stories. You're a grown up now. Life is about work and having a good time. This world is all there is. So jettison all those ancient myths and live in the moment. Pharaoh's second tactic was to destroy faith. Let's now read how he does that. We're going to read 6 through 21. Chapter 5, starting at verse 6. That same day, Pharaoh gave this order to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Then the slave drivers and the overseers went out and said to the people, this is what Pharaoh says, I will not give you any more straw. Go and get your own straw wherever you can find it, but your work will not be reduced at all. So the people scattered all over Egypt to gather stubble to use for straw. The slave drivers kept pressing them, saying, complete the work required of you for each day, just as when you had straw. And Pharaoh's slave drivers beat the Israelite overseers they had appointed, demanding, why haven't you met your quota of bricks yesterday or today as before? Then the Israelite overseers went and appealed to Pharaoh, why have you treated your servants this way? Your servants are given no straw, yet we are told, make bricks. Your servants are being beaten, but the fault is with your own people. Pharaoh said, lazy, that's what you are, lazy. That is why you keep saying, let us go and sacrifice to the Lord. Now get to work. You will not be given any straw, yet you must produce your full quota of bricks. The Israelite overseers realized they were in trouble when they were told you are not to reduce the number of bricks required of you for each day. When they left Pharaoh, they found Moses and Aaron waiting for them, and they said, may the Lord look on you and judge you. You have made us obnoxious to Pharaoh and his officials and have put a sword in their hand to kill us. Think back to that scene at the end of chapter 4, the people bowing down in worship and uh, in gratitude as they accepted Moses' words in faith. They believed, says the text. But Pharaoh piles on the pressure. You want to know who owns the earth and all its resources, he says? Well, I'll show you. Make bricks without straw and see how you get on. As an aside, actually, this passage um, shows a lot of authentic detail about Egyptian society at that time, and it provides strong evidence that the Exodus story actually happened. I'm not just talking about construction methods, I'm, I'm talking about the governance structures that the Egyptians used, uh, which have been verified by archaeologists. And his Pharaoh's brutal plan works brilliantly. The naive faith at the end of chapter 4 is replaced by despair and anger in chapter 5. God's plan seems to have suffered a crushing defeat. So he thought about the defiant enemy. Pharaoh's satanic work was to do what antichrists always do, crush worship and destroy faith. So as we reflect on this second section, in verses 6 to 21, there's an obvious question. What is God doing here? Well, God had promised his people a beautiful inheritance. They would be his people. They would live as free men and women in the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. But if life in Canaan was to be more than a nice version of Egypt, the people would have to learn to trust God. And the new life promised to them would be a life of faith. But faith, if it is to be proved genuine, has to be tested. And so God allows his people to go through this time of testing because in the long run it will develop the pure gold of faith in their hearts. Now that is an important lesson for young believers to learn. Let me say this in all gentleness. If you are a genuine believer, you should expect hardship. It's part of the deal of being part of God's family. He wants to develop you into mature sons and daughters of the Most High. And he has to do that now in the brick kilns of this old world before we get to the new world to come. The Apostle Peter uh, reminds his readers that Christians have been promised an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. But he immediately goes on to say this, now for a little while you may have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, 
which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Of course, sometimes we fail the tests that we're put through. Instead of growing our faith, the enemy succeeds in doing real damage to the people of God. And we see that in Exodus 5. Pharaoh's plan succeeded brilliantly because his real end was to undermine Moses and Aaron. He drove a wedge between the people and their leaders. That often happens, often happens, doesn't it? When the going gets tough, people always need someone to blame. Remember that God had specifically warned the people that Pharaoh would cut up nasty. But the Israelites turned their anger and bitterness onto Moses and Aaron. Now that teaches us something really important about leadership. I am hugely enjoying my year-long sabbatical. I'm into week six, uh, so I can address my fellow elders from an interesting vantage point. And it seems to me that a key function of Christian leadership is to absorb bitterness and anger. Sometimes you just need to stand there and let people take out all their frustration on you. If the church is a car, then most people think that leadership is the steering wheel. But in reality, leaders are usually the shock absorbers. That's why they end up covered in mud. In the years ahead, life is going to get tougher for the Christian community. Churches are going to close down. Congregations will dwindle as families start to look for greener pasture. And you need to appreciate that this is the enemy's real goal, to divide and demoralize the people of God. So as Hebrews puts it in chapter 13, verse 17, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Sometimes the trials of faith can become so severe that a Christian can no longer hear the voice of God. Just glance over to chapter 6 and verse 9. God has uh, given Moses a lovely message of encouragement and assurance. And verse 9 says, Moses reported this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their discouragement and harsh labor. I wonder am I talking to someone this morning uh, whose life has become so bitter that when you read the Bible or you listen to preachers like me, all you hear is blah, blah, blah. You're so lost in despair and anger that Christian truth seems like useless theory. There's a woman in scripture called Mary of Bethany. She used to love to sit at Jesus' feet and learn from him. But something happened in her life. A loved one died. And she was so hurt by the Lord's apparent callousness that when he arrived at the family house, she didn't even go out to greet him. Now, we should never judge Mary for that moment. She had a genuine doubt over whether or not Jesus loved her. So what changed her attitude? It's crucial to follow the text of John 11 closely at this point. She is told that the teacher was asking for her. And it was that title of the Lord Jesus which opened the floodgates of memory of times when she had sat at Jesus' feet and the world had made sense. So she goes out to meet Jesus and they stand together by her brother's tomb. And for a long time, no one speaks. But the two weep together. So my suffering brother or sister, Perhaps you cannot hear the voice of God just now. But know that your Savior, the one who made sense of your life in earlier years, stands beside you. He may not speak, but you will be able to discern his companionship. So at this stage in the story, we seem to be in Dunkirk, don't we? The war against Pharaoh has started with a crushing defeat. To understand what's going on, we're now going to move to the heart of, the, of the, the section we're studying, found in chapter 6, verses 1 to 8. You see, Moses has passed his test of faith. Yes, at the end of chapter 5, we hear him pour out this jumble of angry questions, but at least he has run to God. You see, as a younger man, he had just run away when things get tough. But now we see him run to God. You haven't rescued your people at all, he says to God. So let's now listen to the Lord's response in the first eight verses of chapter 6. Then the Lord said to Moses, Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. Because of my mighty hand, he will let them go. Because of my mighty hand, he will drive them out of his country. God also said to Moses, I am the Lord. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. 
but by name the Lord I did not make myself known to them. To Lucy speak into your soul. Courage, dear heart. In Romans 5, the Apostle Paul reminds us of the state you were in when Christ saved you. And he uses four terms. Powerless, ungodly, sinners, and God's enemies. And think again about what that means. It means that when you were in that terrible and unlovable state, God looked at you and he saw someone so precious that he gave his son for you. God owns everything in the universe, but he gave himself for you. So as an act of the will, lift up your eyes out of your present circumstances and look back. Look back into the past and see that bleeding finger figure standing before Pilate wearing a crown of thorns. See him bear the awful weight of sin. Watch him drink the foaming cup of God's wrath to its very dregs. Now, I'm not trying to instill guilt here. Like Mary of Bethany, I want you to remember how deeply you are loved. But this speech in Exodus 6 also reminds us that God is the God of our present. Just as he heard the despairing cries of his people as they felt the lash of the taskmaster's whip, so God knows your present circumstances. Like a father watching his child run in a school race, even after they've twisted their ankle, God is willing you on. And his heart is full of pride. The friends of Job conceived of God as this aloof, cold figure. In their minds, God was far too lofty to be concerned about Job. But all the while, God was nudging the archangel Michael and saying with pride, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on the earth like him. And finally, the Lord's speech in this chapter reminds us that God is the God of your future. It's interesting that the Lord goes into much more detail uh, in this speech about Israel's future than he did in chapter 3. He talks a lot more about the glorious inheritance of the Lamb that awaits his people in the future. Soon I will lift this terrible yoke from your shoulders, he says, and I will lead you into the promised land that I swore to give you centuries earlier. We live in a culture that seeks to crush worship and destroy faith. Combine that with the yoke of a terrible trial, and it's no wonder that hope can evaporate within your heart. But maybe just now, lift your eyes for a moment. I'll never forget my dear wife sitting in her hospital bed, most of her hair gone, just days before she died. And she quoted those words of the Lord Jesus, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My father's house has many rooms. If that were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. I haven't told you anything new in the last few minutes. But the Lord's words in chapter 6 are very similar to his original words at the burning bush. But here's the point. When we suffer, it is important to remind ourselves of truths that we already know. God is the God of your past. He is the God of our present. He is the God of our future. Perhaps the single biggest lie told by our culture is that we should live in the moment. Now, living in the moment makes sense when you're laughing happily while eating a delicious burger that somebody else has paid for. But in the real world, the world of pain and hurt, the only way life makes sense is when we locate ourselves in the grand story of God's plan. And God's plan has a past, a present, and a future. And it is that story, when we force ourselves to consider it, that allows courage to steal back into the heart. Now, if you glance at Moses' reaction to the Lord's speech, it looks as if it has no effect. If the Israelites will not listen to me, why would Pharaoh listen to me since I speak with faltering lips? He asks that in verse 12. And he repeats that complaint in the very last verse of the chapter. But here's the thing, Moses is changing. The author signals that by placing a big reset marker in the text. Think back. We have seen the angry Moses who lived in the palace. We have met the disillusioned Moses who herded sheep around the backside of the desert. And we have seen the despairing Moses after his Dunkirk moment in chapter 5. But Moses had made his choice. He's now a Hebrew of the Hebrews. 
And that's why the genealogy of Moses and Aaron are placed at this point, just before the real war with Pharaoh begins. Now it's the God of Israel and Moses on one side of the conflict and Pharaoh and his magicians on the other. Now we shouldn't dismiss Moses' complaint about his faltering lips. It is quite possible that he had a speech impediment. And that raises a really sensitive pastoral issue. Why does God not fix our disabilities? Some of the finest Christians I know suffer from some form of disability. It may not be an obvious one like a speech impediment. Sometimes it takes the form of chronic anxiety or even OCD. Spurgeon suffered from depression. And it's a situation that seems to make no sense. Why doesn't God remove this problem when I'm trying my hardest to serve him? I mean, why on earth would you give someone with a speech problem the job of being God's spokesman at this crucial moment in history? Well, it all comes back to faith. Sometimes it is our disabilities which force us to trust God, to wrestle with Paul talks of his thorn in the flesh. And it was that thorn which um, pinned him to the grace of Christ. Disabilities can protect us from those two great enemies of faith, conceit and self-sufficiency. And to see how God deals with Moses, we finish now by reading the opening two verses of chapter 7. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be your prophet. You are to say everything I command you, and your brother Aaron is to tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go out of this country. And drop down finally to verse 6. Moses and Aaron did just as the Lord commanded them. Moses and Aaron have been transformed into realistic warriors. Now they are prepared for hardship. They've regained their courage in the light of crushing defeat. They're aware of their weaknesses, and they walk once again along those marble floors to begin the long war. So with us, we are moving into a period of history when we need realistic warriors. The voices that promise quick victory or the voices that cry despair should both be ignored. In the battle against the defiant prince of this world, we should expect hardship, even the occasional defeat. But courage, dear heart, locate this moment in the context of the gospel story and know that one day the enemy will be defeated. We shall leave the brick kilns and furnaces of this old world and walk into the bright inheritance that has been prepared for us. And as we leave, not a dog will bark. Let us pray. I'll invite the band forward and we'll have a final hymn. Our Father in heaven, once again we think of every precious soul in this room. And you know those who have gone through suffering or who have experienced defeat, who have had their ability and desire to worship and to trust you crushed and destroyed. And so we pray that your word will do its work in the hearts of those who have been hurt, those who are angry or bitter, and that once again they would understand the companionship of Christ and then again to hear the voice of God through your word. We pray, Father, that you raise up a generation of realistic warriors, young men and women who will stand for Christ in a hostile world, knowing that they will have to experience hardship, but that they will find courage in your grand plan, locating their lives within it, and in so doing, help win ultimate victory. Continue with us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jim, for walking us through Moses' encounter with hardship and how it applies to us from the book of Exodus. Um, We're going to close our service this morning by singing the words of 462 in the hymn book, We Rest on Thee. The first verse of this is a great reminder for us on the back of what we've learned from the book of Exodus. It says, We rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe. Strong in thy strength, safe in thy keeping tender, we rest on thee and in thy name 
we go. Just a reminder that for our students, that there's a student lunch through uh, in the room behind me, um, on behind the stage, um, starting at quarter past 12. It'd be great if you could stay behind for that. Um, thank you for joining with us this, with us this morning. Um, after we've sung this hymn, our service will be over. So let's stand to sing. <laughs>